Well, welcome everyone to Spirit of Truth Church for this sermon on Revelation 21, verses 9 through 27. And let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, as we begin to just unravel the amazing depiction of the heavenly Jerusalem, the heavenly city. Lord, may we simply sit in awe of who you are, your glory, and your majesty. As we begin to contemplate what this city represents, as we begin to attempt to imagine its splendor and beauty, and the implications of it for believers, Lord, may we continue to keep at the forefront of your mind the way we got in through Jesus Christ's death on the cross. That, God, this is the picture of where we're going. And it was only by grace through faith that we were able, or we will be able to partake of it. So, Lord, we praise your name. We declare, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you are holy. And we thank you, Lord, for all your blessings for your salvation, and for who you are. In your sovereignty, your justice, your mercy, and your grace. In your name we pray. Amen. And now let's proceed with the reading of the scripture. Then one of the seven angels, who had held the seven bowls, filled with the seven last plagues, came and spoke with me. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. He then carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, arrayed with God's glory. Her radiance was like a very precious stone, like a jasper stone, bright as crystal. The city had a massive high wall with twelve gates. Twelve angels were at the gates, and the name of the twelve tribes of Israel's sons were inscribed on the gates. There were three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. The city wall had twelve foundations, and the twelve names of the Lamb's twelve apostles were on the foundations. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city, its gates, and its wall. The city is laid out in a square. Its length and width are the same. He measured the city with a rod at 12,000 stadia. Its length, width, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall. 144 cubits, according to human measure, which the angel used. The building material of its wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundations of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation, jasper. The second, sapphire. The third, chalcedony. The fourth, emerald. The fifth, sardonyx. The sixth, carnelian. The seventh, chrysolite. The eighth, beryl. The ninth, topaz. The tenth, chrysoprase. The eleventh, jacinth. And the twelfth, amethyst. The twelve gates are twelve pearls. Each individual gate was made of a single pearl. The broad street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. I did not see a sanctuary in it, because the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its sanctuary. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it, because God's glory illuminates it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk in its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Each day its gates will never close, because it will never be night there. They will bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Nothing profane will ever enter it. No one who does what is vile or false, but only those written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Now I'd like to argue that the main idea of this passage is as follows. The eternal kingdom will be a place where God and mankind may once again be face to face in full undisrupted relationship for all eternity. And now for the exegetical concerns of the text. 
And as we approach the exegesis of this, I do want to say a couple of things. First, when John was writing this, I, I would think a thought that might have passed through his mind. Now, again, I can't speak for him, but I would, I would think a thought that might have passed through his mind is, words can't do this justice <laughs> in the sense of what he was beholding must be so far beyond anything that he could possibly imagine that when he did put it into words, <clears throat> he was doing it under the Holy Spirit's instruction. In other words, this is essentially what I want you to say. And this is why you see the angel and the, and the measuring rod and the things like that and, and the pearls and the gates. These are the things that God wanted us to draw our attention to in terms of scripture and in terms of what we would need for our time. But by no means is this a full depiction or, or, or a highly detailed one, even at that. We're getting a glimpse and so again, I think there is some level of let your imagination run wild with this one, sticking obviously within the bounds of scripture, because nothing that we could even imagine is probably even going to come close to the awesomeness and the gloriousness of the heavenly Jerusalem. But I think this is one moment where we can say, this is going to be a lot of fun to just think about what this could possibly look like in reality, because I'm sure John was absolutely blown away. And so let's go ahead and start to dissect some of what's in here and why God put these specific details into Scripture and what themes and what purposes we can glean from that. So first we have this declaration of there being one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls. Now, we don't know that it was the same angel who's been showing John things uh, before as well in Revelation. Uh, it, it's possible, and maybe even, again, highly likely, given that there'd be some continuity there. But again, it's one of the seven angels who brought destruction is now going to show him this new city. And he says, come, I will show you. And what's fascinating to this, or about this, is that similar, this was very similar to uh, the angel showing John Babylon. And I think that there's absolutely a connection being made between the heavenly Jerusalem and Babylon. In other words, come and compare the two. They are of a totally different character and nature. And so again, this new city, it's not replacing it in the sense like, oh, it's going to be there. No, but what it is, is the city that was of man is now gone and destroyed. The city of God and literally of God. It is literally coming from God himself, from heaven. It's coming from God is now here. Uh, again, fascinating comment about this city. And let's take a look again in the text. Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Okay? And then he showed me the holy city. Now, what's interesting about this, what's interesting about this, then it goes on to describe the city. So what is the bride, the wife, the Lamb in this context? It's the city itself. It's the city itself. And so we have this interesting connection here that the, the city is in some way the bride okay the bride of the lamb now interesting to note there's no death in the city at this time thus this is not the millennial this is absolutely the eternal kingdom sin the presence of death and rebellion are done at every point in this depiction and so john talks about he was carried away in the spirit again this is Identical to the phrase introducing John to the harlot in Revelation 17. And again, I think the bride of the lamb, again, drawing a parallel to the harlot, in other words, a woman, only this is the prostitute, the, the wife is the holy city. <clears throat> again, very much inviting the comparison of the two here. Uh, in the spirit would be probably a non-physical, but very real vision or event. Okay, so that's kind of how we can sort of understand this. He really saw it, but again, not necessarily a physical thing but actually seeing it as a spiritual thing. So he takes him up to a great and high mountain. Now, I think, again, this is a direct link to Ezekiel 40, verse 2, and I'll go ahead and read that now. In visions of God, he took me to the land of Israel and set me down on a very high mountain. On its southern slope was a structure resembling a city. Now, the city in Ezekiel was going to be the millennial kingdom city. Okay, that was going to be that Jerusalem. Again, something like the structure of a city. However, now... 
we're seeing it again, only this time we're not seeing the millennial version. Now we're seeing the eternal kingdom version. Okay, It's much bigger. Again, the, the, the two cities are very different. And you'll see that when we get into the dimensions. And so we have this great holy city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. God is the one who builds it. God is the one who's prepared it. It is literally home that God has built and prepared and is now delivering unto the earth. It's coming down. John is actually seeing it in present tense. It's coming down to sitting out of heaven. That's present tense. He's watching this thing enter into earth. Okay. In other words, he's seeing the eternal order being set up. He's seeing the, the inauguration of this. And this city has something very fascinating about it. This city is arrayed with God's glory. Uh, again, in the Greek, doxan tautheo has the glory of God. It's got the visible manifestation of God's presence. And this is why within the city walls, there's no need for light of the sun or the moon. I don't think the sun and the moon are gone. I think there will still be night and days and things of that nature, passage of time. Uh, again, it might not look exactly as it is now, but it, scripture seems to indicate this. It's just that the light won't be needed in the city because the glory of the Lord himself will provide the light for the city. Okay? So it's not that there is no sun, it's just there's no need for it. Okay? The radiance was like a very precious stone, jasper, probably diamond, bright as crystal. Okay, so again, we have this situation where this city is literally shining. Now I want you to think back to verses that talk about, you know, Jerusalem being a city on a hill, a light to the nations. And here, we're going to have the nations, again, be mentioned later on. This city is literally radiating light on a hill. I mean, not only is it spiritually a light on a hill, it is literally radiating light on a hill. I mean, it's, it's crazy how vast, massive this is and how this light, I mean, depending on how the world looks, you'd be able to see this thing from really far away. And it's even theoretically possible I mean, you, you could see potentially, I mean, again, you'll, you'll see how, top, how tall this is, but you'd be able to see this thing from really far away. And so we've got this, this holy city that's got God's light in it. It's the fulfillment of the city on a hill. It's clear as crystal. Now, there's a close analogy between the church and New Jerusalem in terms of purification and preparation. They are not the same thing, but there are a lot of similarities. Okay? It has a great and high wall. Well, you've often heard in Scripture, again, this talk of you have to come in by the door. The, you know, the thief may try to enter into the kingdom over the wall. You can't do that. You have to come in by the door. No one can get into the city who is not saved. The wall is a symbol, again, of protection and salvation, but it's also literal. But again, it, it, it's essentially a real manifestation of the reality of protection and salvation. This is why cities have walls. Okay. But you're going to notice something. There's even 12 angels. The 12 angels are guarding the gates, and then the 12 tribes of the children of Israel are, are the names of the gates. And so we have this going back again to the 12 tribes. But we also have on the foundations the 12 names of the apostles. So we also have the... Now, now again, I know in Revelation the 12 apostles govern the 12 tribes, but the 12 apostles are also heavily associated with the start of the church. You have essentially the church and you have Israel both being represented in this city. One salvation, remember. All 12 tribes are known to God in this situation. None are lost. Now, there's a possibility for these 12 names. One look is that it's similar to the tabernacle in the camp of Israel. Um, but I actually think it's probably going to be more reflective of the millennial kingdom where you actually get Joseph is back in there rather than Manasseh and Ephraim and Levi is also in there as well. I think it's going to actually be the original 12 tribes. Uh, it's going to be more reflective of the millennial city. And again, this wall had 12 foundations. Who are going to be the 12 apostles? Well, some people say, uh, well, be Paul would be the, you know, the 12 that you know, replaced Judas. I actually think it's going to be Matthias. I think he was named the 12th apostle. That the number had to be 12, I think it's going to be Matthias. That is going to be the 12th, the finishing the 12 apostles that names will be in the city. And then he's given this gold reed to measure the city. So let's, let's take a look. Now remember, why give the measurements? Okay, why give the measurements? Same with the millennial kingdom, to show that it's real. To demonstrate this is not a figurative thing. He's not describing the church or something like that as, as a city and using it metaphorically. No, he's measuring it because it's a real measurement. It's because you can measure this. How big is this place? Okay. 
How, how, how big are these measurements? Well, again, a gold read, this is like the gold standard kind of thing. It's highlighting its importance to God and indicating, again, real physical dimensions. But how big is a city? It's a square. 1,380 miles long on each side. 1,380 miles high. If, say for example, you divide it all up evenly to about 102 levels, okay, that would equal the surface area of the Earth's ocean and land masses. 102 levels, 102 floors, if it were just one solid building. It could easily be th up to 340% larger than the total land area, habitable land area in the Earth. And that's huge. In other words, it is very easy to see how this city would be able to hose, hold, house, all saved people throughout all of human history. It is gigantic. Absolutely gigantic. The Eternal City has a total square footage of 1.1 million times larger than the Millennial City. It's huge. Essentially, the entire New Jerusalem is the eternal Holy of Holies. It is the place where God dwells. The fact that the walls are jasper essentially means they're diamond. And, and I want to I talk about this because it talks about being pure gold, like clear glass, with no mention, by the way, of lesser metals, of so silver and bronze. And this is actually quite important because in the temple, if you remember Solomon's temple, um, it went through three, st or, well, four stages, I guess you could say. The first was gold. That was when it was in the pure form, undefiled. Then it was sacked, and they replaced all the implements with silver, sacked again, replaced the implements with bronze, and then sacked again, and then just destroyed. It was, it was laid desolate. So in here, though, we don't have silver and bronze. It's only gold. And the interesting thing is, is the gold is essentially see-through. So it's like clear, clear gold glass almost. And I want to go ahead and just make this comment, because this can be kind of hard to imagine. Um, now... It doesn't say that there's a roof per se, but it does give the height, depth, dimensions, and it talks about the walls. But I just want you to picture this for a moment. If you have essentially see-through gold streets, see-through gold walls that are highly reflective, kind of, you know, kind of like glass reflective, and then you have a glory source or a light source within, what's going to happen? The light is going to reflect off of all of the gold and fill the whole place. Think now back to the Holy of Holies. Everything is essentially decked out in gold in the Holy of Holies. Why? Because it's just you and the glory of God and the glory of God lights the room. And so the gold, the reason for all this gold is to reflect the light that God is giving. And now you imagine that you're looking at this thing from far off and it's just a almost too blinding to look at. It'd be like a little star on the earth is what it would, not little, huge. Like a star on the earth is essentially what this thing would look like because the light would just be shining off of everything. So that's kind of the picture we're getting here. And it's, again, huge. We're talking able to house all humanity, saved humanity throughout history. Now, just for, for a, a point of comparison, what is 1,380 miles? The length of the state of Illinois is 390 miles. Illinois. It's 1,380. So think something like, so we'll say we're around to 400, say, and 1,400. You're talking almost three and a half to four Illinois long, three and a, four, three and a half to four Illinois wide and three and a half to four Illinois tall. I mean, at that point, you're talking about the, the, roughly the size of the United States. I mean, it, it's huge, larger, really, than the United States. It's huge. And remember, that's city. That's not like most of it's uninhabited. That's all city. So imagine city from like northern Canada all the way down to Mexico, and city from the east coast to the west coast. And it's just city the whole way. This thing is 
unreal in what it would look like reflecting God's glory. But it's not like a city around here. It's not like crowded buildings and and just dingy and bad smelling and dirty. Oh no, it's not like that at all. The walls are adorned with precious stones of all kinds. In other words, the walls are just radiating not only light, not only gold, but they're just radiating every color under the sun. Now, again, why? Well, the precious stones, one, it was a symbol of, of, of op, not opulence, but symbol of, you know, again, the 12 tribes. It's, it's, there's a lot of symbolism to this in terms of the breastplate that people would wear in the old times in the Levitical law. But these stones, it, it, they're just everywhere on the walls. So you're thinking, this is glorious when you walk and you see it. Now, it's hard to connect them to the tribal stones because of the issues of, well, what stone really is what. But then we get to these gates. Solid pearl. One pearl per gate. In other words, it's one continuous thing. And why pearl? Well, I think pearl, there's a lot, there's a lot of interesting things with pearl. Pearl comes from an unclean creature. Okay. In scripture, the creature that gives rise to the pearls, uh, to the clam, or the oyster, I guess, I think it's the clam, um, essentially is unclean. Okay, it's a shellfish. But what comes out of it is something beautiful. And there is definitely, given the pearl of great price and, and some other, other things as well, that this may stand as a testimony that the redeemed among the Gentiles are no longer considered unclean and can now pass through the gates. Because the Gentiles came from an unclean people, but they're made clean. The whole streets look like a sea of glass. Gold glass. Pearl gates. I mean, think the most just beautiful, ornate, entryway you've ever seen them multiplied by a thousand and that's the gates and they're probably going to be gigantic i mean absolutely gigantic because it's not like these gates are going to be fit for one or two people on a side no you can see these gates from afar and they're big enough in the walls you know i mean you're, you're these gates may be you know like they may be a mile wide themselves. I mean, we don't know. We aren't given the dimensions. But, I mean, think of these gates as like these giant things that, you know, you pass through it, you're looking up, and you're looking into the sky practically to see the top of this thing. Okay? Then we hit this fascinating part of the text that talks about how there was no temple. Now, why was there no temple? Let's take a look back in the text. He did not see a sanctuary in it. Because the Lord Almighty and the Lamb are at sanctuary. In the Garden of Eden, it was just man in the garden. Tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil. God walked with man. After the fall, man now had to have a sanctuary. A place where man and God could meet, where man would not immediately fall under God's wrath. A place where God had designated to meet man, where he could purify him externally in some way so that he would be able to be in his presence for a short period of time. And that's really it. The temple acted as this. The tabernacle acted as this. We had to have temples. The millennial kingdom has a temple. Why? There's still sin and death in the world, even in the millennial kingdom. That's why there has to be a temple. Sacrifices are much different in the millennial kingdom, and we can get into those at some point. But you still need a temple. But now, in the eternal kingdom, you don't need a temple because man and God can walk together, finally, at peace, in perfect harmony for all eternity. It was always intended that God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit essentially are the temple. That was all that, that that is our sanctuary. That God is our sanctuary. That's exactly what this is saying. And the city doesn't need to light the sun and moon because God's glory literally illuminates it, and its lamp is the Lamb. Now it talks about nations walking in its light. They will walk in its light. In other words, the city isn't the whole thing. There's still, again, new heavens and new earth, whatever this means, a new earth. And there are going to be people who live in the city. There are going to be people who don't live in the city, but come to visit the city, maybe stay there for periods of time, and then leave and go back to their other homes. And so these nations that will exist under God will come to worship God. They will come to give God gifts and give God glory. In other words, it's humanity operates as it should. In other words, this is the fulfillment of the creation mandate. Man was never supposed to remain in Eden forever. He was supposed to go throughout the earth, subdue it, 
and, and give dominion to it. Similarly, you have the New Jerusalem, but you also have people going throughout the whole earth and bring it under the rule of God. Only at this point, it's completely under the rule of God. Praise his name. And this is one of the most beautiful pieces of this. To any Jewish person who understands the Old Testament really well, they'd read this last verse and they'd say, oh, praise the Lord. Because it says each day its gates will never close because it will never be night there. Now, what you understand is, is gates being closed, man could not come in. Okay? Temple. Essentially ended up being closed. It talks about the temple, the gates closing because the little glory of God would never leave. But now the gates are open and they'll never close again. There's no more sin, no more death. They'll never close because it will never be night there. In other words, people will always be able to come. They'll bring glory and honor of the nations into it. And nothing profane will ever enter it. If you ever want to know if there's a promise of no more sin, no more anything, it's right here. Nothing will ever enter it, nothing profane. No one who does what is vile or false, but only those written in the Lamb's Book of Life. In other words, this final eternal kingdom is for saved people only. This is after the great the lake of fire judgments, after the, the great white throne judgment. And so here we have this un, almost unreal depiction of this city that, that we just can barely even imagine. And this is the city that God has planned for those who believe. And so now I'd like to move into the exposition. So what, what do we draw from this? Well, first I would like to say, in terms of history, this is the conclusion or fulfillment of history. This is the, this is the purpose, it really gives us the purpose to which God has done all things. Why? In the eternal kingdom, we see that God is glorified through his sovereign reign. This is the thing that sort of sums up the whole point. Why is God doing this? He has brought glory through his sovereign reign. He is glorified through his reign in heaven and on earth. What does this include? It includes salvation and redemption. Some people would argue, oh, well, all of history is for salvation and redemption. I would disagree because there's judgment as well. There's judgment. There's also sovereignty. There's a lot of other things, and that's not all included in salvation and redemption. But his sovereignty and his reign does include all of those things. That's why I think it is. You've got salvation and redemption. You have a redeemed people. He is reigning in those people, and over those people. It includes physical splendor and glory. He's created this beautiful new place for us to live. It includes holiness. His sovereignty dictates holiness. It includes human submission to God under human under, under the sovereign God. It includes uh, people subduing and populating the earth. In other words, God's rule and reign is being executed through humans throughout the earth. I would argue this really sums up everything. God's glory alone. It's one of the five solas. It's vitally important. Uh, God's glory alone is the point. And how does his glory um, most essentially manifest if we had to sum it all up? Through his sovereignty. His will, and that alone, is now done on heaven and earth in the eternal kingdom. It's kind of amazing. Now, what's another theme that comes out? Well, the church, Israel, and the nations. So we see mention of all three in this, in the eternal order. We see the Israel. We see, we see, now we don't, what we don't see is people being divided at this point. But we do see these designations still present. We see Designate. It's not like, oh, well, the Jewish people live here and the Gentiles live here. We don't see that. What we do see, though, is there's a recognition of these groups. We see Israel's being recogn recognized through the gates. We see the churches being recognized through the apostles uh, in the foundation. We see the nations being recognized and that there are nations and they do come and give glory to God here. This is the eternal order. There's people in the eternal kingdom. There's people in the city. There's people throughout the earth. <clears throat> So these aren't just throwaway distinctions. These are distinctions that, in some sense, remain for eternity. Now, on to the Christocentric setting. I want to dive into a little bit more of this idea of there's no physical temple. It's just the violent sun. Like, at this point, you, you have to acknowledge the full divinity of the Father and the Son. <laughs> if, if the Son is literally the lamp that lights the whole thing... And he and God are in the God Almighty of the sanctuary. So doctrinally, this is very strong language of Jesus as God. Doctrinally, this is very strong language um, that um, that not only that, but but they're they're put together, and you're not even seeing in this um, a a hierarchy. You know, some people say, "Oh, the the Son is less than the Father." Something you're not even seeing that there. You're just seeing, you no, know, they both together are the sanctuary. Um, at this point, um, again. That's kind of how this is operating, how the Trinity is operating. So I want to kind of point that out here. God can now be approached directly. Uh, and there's a difference in millennial and eternal kingdom here, right? You, you don't see this is not millennial at this point. This is absolutely eternal kingdom. And then finally, Chris Sanders setting, 
we have to recognize that Jesus is the one who redeemed mankind through the cross. And that made all this possible. None of this is possible without Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection. He made it possible. He made a way. There is no utopia without Christ. There is no better world without Christ. There is no justice without Christ. There is no reconciliation without Christ. There is no love without Christ. It's him and him alone. And the sooner that we begin to really recognize and, and understand this and actually allow this to begin to impact our decisions, the better off we'll be. It is only through him that we get to the eternal kingdom. We can't make the eternal kingdom here on this earth now. Now, now we can invite people. We can invite people to the eternal kingdom. We can invite people and say, hey, you've sinned. We've all sinned. But Jesus Christ died for your sins. And if you take him as your Lord and Savior, you will have eternal life and an eternal home. Now, in terms of application, this really is the future hope defined and laid out. This is what it's all for. It's for a time when we will be with God face to face. It's a time when his glory will illuminate. It's a time when everyone will be at peace, love and harmony, where work will be joyous. It's a time where we will be able to worship God free of sin, free of death, free of tears. It will be more beautiful than anything we could possibly imagine. There will be no, we will be at perfect peace with creation and the created order. We will live in light of this eternal kingdom. As a result of this knowledge that he's given us, to some extent, we should understand that this, this earth and this age just is not our home. We have a better home. We should be able to pick up and fight the true spiritual battle that Scripture talks about. The battle's not against flesh and blood, it's against principalities and powers and the accuser. Fight that spiritual battle while we're here on this earth. Not all these other little battles that the world would love to get us distracted with. Hold on to the promise of salvation now and the kingdom in eternity. The gospel is the good news that Jesus Christ has come and died for your sins. This is providing for a kingdom in the future. And so in conclusion, I would like to say this. Praise the name of Jesus that he has saved us from our sins and that he has prepared the heavenly Jerusalem and the new heavens and the new earth for us to occupy for eternity. That we will have peace and relationship with God and each other forever. And now I'd like to close in prayer. Dear Lord, we praise your name. We thank you for this time of reflection on your, your heavenly kingdom. And Lord, we look forward to it with anticipation. We know there's still a good long way to get there. But Lord, thank you for showing us this in advance. We praise you, God. That's the only response. Praise you. We sit in awe of you. We have proper fear of the Lord. We love you. Lord, help us all to live for you each day by the power of your spirit, by the letter of your word, and by union with Jesus Christ. In the name we pray, amen. Well, thank you all for joining us here at Spirit of Truth Church, and I hope you have a wonderful evening.